Good morning everyone and welcome to the first live video for the uh, 2020 100 day challenge. So the purpose of this challenge is to do a 100 day sprint until uh, before the end of the year. Sorry, I'm just looking around because I've meant to bring um, a particular journal with me to share with you and um, I of course um, don't have it. But um, so, so we basically want to get into a sprint towards the end of the year. Hi, Cans, good to see you. And, um, and more and more research is showing. Hi, B, good to see you. And I see Michelle Lowe is on with us as well. So it's a um, lovely turnout this morning. It's obviously a good time of the day to do these lives. Um, and so it's, there's, there's a lot of research around um, goals and goal setting that shows us nowadays that these um, short sprint type goals, calling them sprints, um, is really, really effective. And so we're doing a 100 day sprint. Um, I very, very often do um, like 50, uh, 30 day challenges with my dietitian where I commit to doing three things differently every day for 30 days not not doing three things differently every day hi Catherine hi Sally good morning lovely to see you um oh great and you are each other's accountability partners that's awesome well done um so I do a lot of um 30 day sprints morning Alexa and um and by the end of the month, I have to account to my dietitian for whether or not I have done these things. And so I actually, um, you know, track them um, quite carefully in my journals. I write them down and, you know, every day basically um, treat them as a new habit or a new um, uh, tradition, uh, you know, way of doing things that I want to form. And I'm hoping that by the end of this, um, challenge, this 100 day challenge, because we know that it takes, you know, around 60 days to lay down, um, morning Janice, to lay down new neural pathways. Um, and so uh, with a 100 day challenge, we will really be able to get in there and lay down super highways for all of you, like real autobahns when it comes to, um, getting your marketing and sales coming alive and injecting um, energy into it. So there are three things I want to chat about today. The first is um, effective goal setting and just share a little bit of um, research with you. Um, you know me, I love my research. Then I want to chat about cognitive dissonance because I think that this is quite an important psychological concept to, um, to speak about when we are setting goals. And finally, hot off the press, on my desk, in my inbox yesterday, uh, the executive summary of the global ICF, 2020 ICF global survey of the coaching industry landed. So I'm just going to share a couple of things that I have picked out of there that I think you might find quite interesting. Um, and then what I will also do is um, share the PDF of the ICF research um, in this group so that you can access it as a document. So for those of you who haven't met me yet and don't know me, know me well, I describe myself as a business and marketing coach and I'm a tree-loving dog or tree-hugging, dog-loving marketing and business coach. I often take my dogs for walks in the forest um, just to do my you know, business thinking and get my head around things. And um, there are regularly um, uh, missiles, you know, letters from the forest <laughs> where I dictate into my phone as I'm on my walks and something occurs to me. Um, but I find it a wonderful place to just really stimulate my brain, a wonderful way of um, learning new things and stim stimulating my brain. Uh, but I do specialize in helping um, co uh, coaches find and define your niche. And um, I've got a 12-week marketing and sales accelerator program, which is an ongoing program. And um, you can sign up and join it at any time if you are interested. But that's enough about me. Let's get into the meaty stuff. So just recently.
Recently, I think in about 2019, two researchers, Fischbach and Choi, they looked at um, the goal setting process and um, they took a, um, a whole lot of students at a university who, um, you know, they were um, postgraduate students, so they all had quite heavy degrees on their um, backs and, you know, quite heavy academic loads. And what they did was they, they kind of um, set them different um, tasks and outlines in terms of um, how they were to go about at, um, uh, with the, the whole goal setting process. So with the one set of students, they allowed them to set what they call achievement goals, which are kind of huge, big overall the, the final end goal that, that you want to achieve. Now, we all know that writing our goals down is one of the first steps in effective goal setting. Pardon me. But with the second group of students, what they did was they sat with them and they made them break their end goals, which might have been, you know, getting a PhD or a master's um, qualification. They made them break their end goals down into much smaller process goals. So in other words, if you are working towards um, an advanced degree, um, you there's certain things that you need to do, like framing your proposal, submitting your proposal. So that would be one goal. And within that, that would be chunked down. Um, there's the reading that you have to do. So again, um, that would be chunked down into every um, week or every day, the individual had to read a different academic paper or a different um, book, but you get you get the drift. So there's this big difference between what they call achievement goals, which are the goals that you are heading for at the very, very end, and your process goals. Now, some of you have heard me talk about these before, but I use the most amazing journals. And I'm just going to dig on my desk um, to see. Uh, oh, bugger. Um, and no, I don't have one around me. So they're called best self journals and each journal lasts for 13 weeks. Now, basically, we are 100 day sprint is a 14 week sprint. So in other words, um, I would be able to quite comfortably use one of these best self journals for something like this. And the reason why I started using them, and I don't want to promote them necessarily because I'm going to tell you how they work, um, is because last year I did a postgrad um, uh, certificate um, and I knew that I was going to have to be very, very intentional about the goals that I set for myself and about um, making sure that I kept on track with my smaller milestones in terms of um, getting towards those goals. So the very first three pages of the journal are each a page that is um, dedicated to um, identifying one goal so you on each page you identify a single big achievement goal something that you want to achieve by the end of the sprint in that particular journal you then break that down because it covers a period of about three months and we're going to be spending the next three months together your next job is to break your big achievement goal down into smaller um, three smaller chunks and then your task is to take those three smaller chunks and to break them down into weekly milestones that you need to reach during the course of this 100, 100 day challenge. So um, you start off with your overall goal, um, what, what, the, what, the big thing that, that you want to achieve by, by the end of this challenge, you break that down into monthly bite-sized pieces and each of those monthly pieces you break down into weekly milestones. 
And what you need to be doing in your journals is every day you need to have at the top of your page what your um, your uh, process goals are for that particular week. And so that you can measure during the course of the day the decisions that you make. You can say, is this moving me closer to my bigger goals? But in the context of what you set for yourself for that week. Now, Candace made quite an important um, comment uh, on Facebook about when she set her goals. And I think you used the term um, something along the lines of three goals settled upon. And so that made me want to talk about the concept of cognitive dissonance. Because we shouldn't be setting goals that we don't 100% buy into and believe. There's, there's a, there's a, we create a huge amount of psychological conflict in a conflict um, and, and enormous problems for ourselves and barriers to achieving our goals when the overall goals that we set are things that are um, that we say we must. So for example, it might be, um, I'll use myself for an example, um, that over the next three months, I must lose 10 kilograms, okay? But, and, and intellectually in my head, I know that I'm overweight. I know that I'm, I could really, really do with losing some weight. But, my subconscious mind still likes to have, you know, um, a minty arrow every now and again. And my food choices, uh, my food preferences are preferences for foods that don't support the goal that I've said that I must achieve. So because, because I, I might be rewarding myself with food or comforting my, myself with food. So, you know, I'll be going for the, the higher carbohydrates, the, you know, the foods that, that give you more of a dopamine um, rush and a feel-good feeling. So the important thing is I want you to go back to the three goals that you have identified that you want to achieve during this, this sprint. And I want you to say, have I identified this because I feel I must do this? Or do I really, really want to do this? And one of the um, big things that you need to do is to identify some kind of really meaningful reward that you will give yourself and you contract to give it to yourself at the end of the sprint period. So... Candice is saying exactly, rewards for achieving tasks. In the journals that I use on a daily basis, so um, the, the practice is in the morning to identify three things that you're grateful for and in the evening to do the same thing. But in the evening when you're looking back over your day to also identify um, one or more wins that you've achieved against your identified goals for that day. Okay, so you remember you're working within your weekly goals at this stage, at this point. And then it's got a, another section where you have a look at, uh, uh, you know, you look over each week. And at the end of the week, you also say, what was my biggest win for the week? What was the happiest moment, most rewarding moment for me? Um, so, so, yes, we really do need to focus on uh, making sure that the goals that we set are meaningful goals, that they are goals that we actually want to achieve and have aren't setting for ourselves to force ourselves into achieving them or you know maybe um, re if, if, if you have got a goal that you have put out there because you think okay I'm going to use this challenge and the accountability in the next over the next hundred days to to eat this frog that I really you know, don't feel like eating, um, maybe relook that goal and see if you can frame it in another way or if you can revise it ever so slightly or um, just uh, reword it um, in a way that is going to, um, oh dear, 
um, can I have some likes um, or hearts? Catherine's saying that she's got signal problems and um, I can see there are still nine people on. I just want some some likes or hearts to know whether or not um, the rest of you can still see me or am I talking to myself? Ah, Candace can see me. Okay. Thank you, my sweetie. So, um, just keep giving the likes and hearts so that I know that you're there um, uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, th thank you, I appreciate you. Okay, so Sally, you can see me. Michelle, you can see me. Okay, awesome. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. And if you could just carry on. Thanks, B. I'm dropping them every now and again. Um, I, I will really appreciate it. Then I know that the signal um, is okay. Oh, you guys are stars. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so we've spoken about cognitive dissonance and the um, important role that that plays. Because basically, if you're setting yourself up to do something that you feel you absolutely must, must, must do, the problem with that is that if your subconscious mind um, doesn't agree with you, um, it's going to undermine you every step of the way. And you're going to have those um, tasks or those small steps that you'll um, need to do in, or complete in order to achieve your overall goal. And you're going to procrastinate. You're going to put them off. You're going to find other things to do. Um, and you eventually you're going to set yourself up for failure um, if you don't um, make sure that these are really meaningful goals that you um, that you really um, want to achieve. So I just want you to go back today after this and reflect on those goals that you have um, set for yourself. And Candice, um, you, you said that you'd settled upon um, three goals. I want you to please go back and have a look and make sure that you're not doing something that you feel you should do or you must do, but that you're rather doing something that you really, really want to do and really want to achieve. Um, and maybe it's just a case of how you... Um, how, how you um, word it and if you could change the wording ever so slightly. So welcome Nandipa, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, okay, so I mentioned that the um, ICF, the 2020 ICF Global Research Survey had landed um, in my inbox yesterday. Um, I'd, uh, I could Got, got a copy of it because I participated in it as one of the, and you don't have to be any, any special snowflake or unicorn to um, participate in the research. They put a, a general invitation out once, um, I think they do it every four years, and they put a, an invitation out to the industry. So really, you know, I was just uh, uh, one of those people who picked up um, a social media post about the fact that they were looking for people to do the survey. So what has happened? Well, coaching, um, it's shown coaching has increased tremendously since the last time um, they did the uh, survey. They now estimate that there are 71,000 professional, properly qualified coaches out there in the marketplace globally. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but um, if I look at the figures for the um, Middle East and Africa, let me just find them quickly. Um, oh, gosh. Um, so, they, I think they're underestimating a little bit. They're talking about for um, the Middle East and Africa, they're estimating 4,100 coaches. And that's possibly based on a combination of their membership and the people who've participated in the survey. But nevertheless, we have now moved into a completely different realm when it comes to how we work with our clients. Um, and that is the realm of working online. And that means that not only can we work globally, but all, everybody else in the coaching world and industry can work globally before, uh, uh, globally as well, using technology like Zoom, etc., etc. So it's forced a lot of us 
um, into the fourth industrial revolution, uh, some, you know, many of us against our will, having to learn new skills and also kind of get over a lot of fears um, that we have around this whole world of, you know, mastering technology that we're not used to, um, where we used to rely on things like networking to get um, uh, bring us new business. Uh, we now have to rely very, very largely on um, our presence on online and in particular on social media. Um, and we all know that um, uh, social media is starting to trend and the, the online world is starting to trend towards um, video. Um, at the moment, I think they are saying, I forget the figures, I think at the moment they are saying that 80% by the end of this year, 80% of all content is going to be consumed via video. And by, um, I think by 2024, um, almost 100% of all content online is going to be video content. So um, it's, it's, it's quite a tough thing to get your head around um, if you're not used to it. But I can assure you that as with everything and even with learning how to coach, the more you do it, the better you get at it and the easier it becomes. Now one of the um, other things that was, was quite um, interesting was that um, coaches on average internationally are reporting um, a, um, an, an annual income. Thank you for that um, like, whoever gave that to me. I know that you're still there watching. Um, coaches are reporting an annual, an average annual income of $50,000. So um, if we are talking in today's um, South African dollar terms, uh, you know, you can do the sums yourself. But I think that works out at about um, half, well over, well over half a million rand per annum. And I think I can comfortably say, given conversations that I've had with a number of coaches, that they would be only too happy to um, be able to report an annual income from their coaching of uh, in excess of half a million rand. So the one of the purposes of this challenge is to say, if you are not one of those coaches who is billing um, you know, at that kind of level from your coaching, what can we do? What can, you know, and how can we um, give a, a real injection of um, vitality into your marketing and sales uh, to get you to that point? Um, so the, the, some of the other uh, research was um, around uh, the typical coaching clients. Um, is aged between 35 and 44 um, years old. 37% of the coaching clients are aged, um, you know, in that age gap. Um, but what we are finding is that the majority of um, coaches fall into a slightly older age gap, or, um, you know, as re pardon me, as reported um, in this particular survey. The ICF um, published a um, article um, at the beginning of this year, and they spoke about um, the fact that more and more clients are going to be expecting um, quicker results um, from from their uh, from the coaching interventions, and so the the clients will look for coaches who specialize in getting results like driving fast results and fast transformation in specific um, problem areas. And so the ICF is recommending um, that as coaches, we, we get really clear um, in our messaging about those areas that we are particularly outstanding in and where we um, really do our best work, which is not to say that we can't work outside of those areas. But if somebody is looking for a coach who um, specifically gets 
uh, wizard results in um, working with a particular type of person or with um, a, a particular type of team or, you know, uh, team issues or problems. You need, you want to be that coach. You want your um, profiles online to clearly state that you are the no-brainer for them to pick to get the results, the fast results that they want. So um, one of the trends is that coaching interventions are going to become shorter, working with these coaches that specialize in, you know, these, these certain areas. In fact, um, coaching is probably, you could say there will, become, there will be a trend for um, us to do coaching sprints where we really, really focus with our clients on specific things intensively over a short period of time. So get used to um, the, the probability that um, your coaching interventions will be shorter. Um, they are going to be far more um, results driven and, and um, output driven because the uh, corporate clients in particular are looking for um, a bang for their buck, bang, bang for their investment. Again, the um, research highlights that um, uh, relationships uh, drive um, uh, drive uh, um, business, and um, and that fundamentally. Um, uh, it's it, it you'll get business based on the quality of your relationships. Now, um, I know that um, we are in a situation where relationship building um, is having to be done at a distance, and we're having to get to know new people without meeting right now, without meeting them sometimes in person, and. Um, it goes against a lot of what is in the DNA of coaching, which is, you know, being able to sit in the same room as your client, being able to have that one on one contact, being able to pick up on, you know, all of the um, nonverbal um, body language that is going on. And all of a sudden you, we, we feel um, that we can't be as effective in the way that we work with our clients uh, because of this barrier of technology. So we do have to get our mindsets around this new way of working and the fact that um, relationships can still, or good relationships can still be built uh, in the online world. In fact, Candace, who's on this challenge, and you can probably see her um, comment up on the screen right now, she and I met and developed our relationship and friendship um, through the virtual world. And it was only um, a few months ago, just I think just before we went into lockdown, that Candace and I actually met for the very first time. And that was after we'd known each other for uh, um, over a year. So Candace says, um, I'm not a coach, but this analogy can be applied to your business. Focus on an area and become an expert in it and also build a network to whom you can refer other work. That's such an important thing, Candace. And that's why um, in um, whenever I run challenges and have people coming in and you, you'll you notice that on, I think it was day two, I asked you guys to pick, a, you know, get an accountability partner um, for this challenge. I think that it is, the, the, these kinds of environments are phenomenal environments within which you can build your network and expand the possibilities of what you can offer your clients. And also, we can't all be all things to all people. I don't know that I want to be all things. To, I, I, in fact, I read, I know that I don't want to be all things to all people. There's certain work that 
I'm just not interested in doing. It doesn't um, give me any kind of uh, reward. I, do, I don't get any um, lovely neurotransmitters or hormones um, firing um, in my brain when, when I do certain work. And so I would rather outsource that to somebody who does get excited about it and who does want to do that kind of work. So uh, participating in a challenge like this and the more you give, the more you get out of it, um, the more you um, participate, the more people get to know you and will start to recognize you as, oh, that's so-and-so, you know, and she's specialized. I can um, go to her for X, Y, Z. So I do encourage you um, very strongly to network with each other. Um, you are um, very welcome to use this group uh, to expand your circle of potential colleagues that you can cross refer work to work collaborate with in on projects um, and remember this is also a space where as an entrepreneur working by yourself and for yourself in your business this is also a space where you're not necessarily alone and you can actually share your challenges um, with your peers and colleagues and you know collectively we can create solutions so that's um, all I have for you for today so we've spoken a little bit about goal setting and um, Jana says I'm a trainer and consultant not a coach either uh, but I've found Megan's other challenges invaluable thanks Janice I really appreciate you for that um, I, I, and you know it, it, I try and make the information that I give fairly generic and not too coach specific, although coaching is my area of um, expertise and subject, you know, subject matter knowledge. Um, so it's easy for me to talk about, but these principles can be applied across the board. And I think in particular, knowing that if you force yourself to try and achieve goals where there's a cognitive dissonance, that was the second point that I spoke about earlier today, um, you're actually setting yourself up for failure because you're going to have your subconscious mind, you're going to be putting it at war with your conscious brain. So please make sure, go back over those goals that you have set and make sure that you haven't set them just to please somebody else um, or because you you know, feel that there, there should goals or must, kind of, you know, the, the goals that you must achieve. I would rather you get to the end of this 100 days, maybe not having achieved what you felt you must achieve, but certainly with a sense of achievement because you set three goals that would move you forward, that would will get you closer to where you need to be. So look a little bit more broadly in your business if you identify that one or more of the goals that you've identified um, isn't exactly right for you. Um, I spoke about my journals and um, the, so the best self journals, great timing Alexa. Um, I imported them from, um, you can, you've got to buy them from the States and um, I've always only used pencil in them so um, I go back and rub out the previous year's worth of work and then um, start again. So we, we, um, like I'm using them for the, the second round um, but you can get them um, from the States and I think that at the moment they're actually having um, specials on the um, journals so um, you just, I think it's best self or one word dot co is their um is their website but you can google best self journals and it'll come up for you and you can buy them in packs of four um but beware um they do carry uh heavy um what's it called, uh, import duties at the moment. And for some reason, because of coronavirus, um, to try and, you know, import anything, um, you are paying prohibitive um, import duties and import fees. So um, I do, do just want to um, um, warn you about that. Maybe what, I'll, um, what I can do is take a photograph of um, the pages that I've spoken about um, just to help you guys 
um, get an idea of um, the process that um, I go through because I've really really found them incredibly intentional you know last year um, at the beginning of the year I launched a new business in a partnership um, then I started um, um, my postgraduate uh, certificate through the um, University of Stellenbosch's business school I then um, launched Niche Intelligence, um, which is a really kind of a, a spin-off from the, the business that I had been running, the coaching um, consultancy that I'd been running for the last, um, you know, 20 odd years. Um, but just <clears throat> if you have a look at my business history over time, you will see that my own journey has been from um, being quite a generalist as a coach to um, becoming more and more of a specialist. So specializing in working with coaches on their marketing and sales and um, in particular on helping coaches find and define their niche. So I launched Niche Intelligence in about May or June of last year. Um, I also then uh, went on a, a three-month online course and um, as no sooner had I finished that three-month online course, I um, signed up for another six-month online course and um, I cannot tell you how they helped me in keeping me focused and um, in making sure that I kept myself accountable for at the very least every single day achieving the three things that I had um, set out for that day as being the most important things to attend to to shift me closer to my goals. One of my biggest learnings was that, and I'm, I'm sure I'm, you know, I'm talking to the converted here, but one of my biggest learnings was that we completely underestimate the amount of time that it takes us to do things. And I would set myself up for failure because I would say, okay, today these are the three um, tasks that I need to complete by the end of today, you know, on top of any other work that was coming in for the day. And um, just one of those tasks alone, if when I really broke it down and started working on it and got realistic about it, was like a week's worth of work. I should have broken it down and split it up over a week uh, instead of setting myself up for failure and expecting myself to do a week's worth of work in one day. I mean, you know, I was really daft, but it was these journals that helped me to learn um, how I was over committing myself and how I was putting far too much pressure on myself. Hi Catherine, glad to see you're still with us. Um, so they, they really did um, help tremendously but by all means go and have a look at their website because you'll be able to um, also see some of their other journals. And um, yeah, Sadie's saying absolutely, I underestimate all the time how long, <laughs> we really, we, put, we set ourselves up for failure. And um, yeah, so, so those have been quite um, powerful tools for me um, in helping me to be really intentional about my work, where I put my energy and where I put my focus. Um, so I've spoken again about cognitive dissonance and um, later on during the course of today, if you watch the group, I will share the um, executive summary of the ICF research so that you can go through it um, yourself if, you're, um, if you haven't received it and if you are interested. But thank you all for, um, for joining me this morning, bright and early, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Those of you who know me know that as far as I'm concerned, it's the middle of the night because I'm a real night owl. So, uh, but I must say, I think it did work out well because there's um, been such a lovely um, group on board. And so I really want to appreciate all of you and appreciate all of your time because one of the things I'm conscious about when you give up the time to take part in something like this and to listen listen to, um, uh, hi Jo, lovely to see you, oh that's who it was, okay cool, um, I'm really conscious that um, a lot of you charge by the hour and so you've just given me 40 of your precious billable minutes 
And so I do want to appreciate you and thank you for giving me these minutes, giving me this time, and I hope that it's been worth it in terms of the value. I'll see you um, next week at the same time, so you can stick that in your diaries for, for the next 14 weeks. And um, watch, watch the uh, Facebook feed tomorrow for uh, your task. We're going to be having some fun. Ciao for now, everyone. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye.